Hey everybody, it's Jeremy here. I just wanted to greet you at the head of this, our third episode of Adapter Parish. In this episode, we're going to be talking about Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, but before we get started, I just wanted to address a piece of feedback that we received recently. Now, full disclosure, when we were originally putting all this together, Ariel and I talked about the idea, well, should we tell people what episodes are coming up next? She thought we should. I argued, oh no, it's it's more exciting if we if we don't if if it's like a surprise for people and we can like give a hint as to what the next episode is. Uh, here's the deal. Uh, it turns out I was wrong and she was right, and we've received quite a bit of feedback that people want to know what episode is coming up so they can like do prep. Hey, here's the deal. I'll own that. That one's on me. Um, we received uh, that piece of feedback from a number of people, including uh, Mike, one of our listeners. So I just wanted to announce right now that uh, two things. One, from now on, at the head of every episode, we will be announcing the following episode two weeks later. The second thing is. Let's talk about what episode is coming after Pride and Prejudice. So in two weeks, we are going to be talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. We read The Hobbit and we watched a whole bunch of Hobbit movies to talk about it. But today, it's all about Pride and Prejudice. So without further ado, here we go. right now they make no sense that's okay i literally have a note that just says the dog scene i don't know what to do with that that's fine okay can we do a podcast now yeah go for it start us start us up hello and welcome to adapt or perish i am arielle lipshaw and i'm jeremy latour and today we're going to be talking about jane austen's pride and prejudice that's right which is a wonderful book that i've read a million times since i was uh, since i was a little girl growing up in maine how many times have you read Pride and Prejudice? Once. I finished it today. Yay. Yeah, it's and, great. Do you want to, what did you think about it? I really liked it. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about I it. I liked it a whole lot. So for this episode, we both read Pride and Prejudice. Well, I reread Pride and Prejudice. How many times have you read it? Um, you know, probably not as many times as I have seen the 1995 miniseries Pride and Prejudice. Which I think is true for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I feel like. Which we're totally going to be talking about as well. Yeah. I guess I feel like. My primary relationship, unlike when we talked about Anne of Green Gables, that I said my primary relationship was with the book, and mm-hmm. I felt like a lot of people really had a primary relationship with the miniseries. In this case, I, like most people, have a really strong relationship to the 1995 Colin Firth, Jennifer Ely, Pride and Prejudice. Mm-hmm. But we did not stop there. No, we didn't. Because we also watched the 2005 Kira yes. Knightley feature film. Yes, directed by Joe Wright. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, we have some thoughts about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will say, I just want to say up front that I feel like, and I don't know if this is something that you are like tuned in with, but there's definitely debate amongst people that are into Jane Austen adaptations about which Pride and Prejudice is better. And oh. I just want to state off the bat that I know that there are people out there for whom the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, that is their Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, So anything that we say, I hope it's just taken in in good humor because (laughs) I I, I just want to respect the fact that I know... We're going to offend so many people. I know that there are those of you out there who like that is your Pride and Prejudice Mm -hmm. and I want to be respectful of that. On the other hand, I hated it very much. So, Just to be clear, the 2005 version. Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about it. I think we are putting the cart well before the horse at this so point. So to speak. So let's talk about the book for a little bit. Mm-hmm. I've never read this before. Yeah. It's ha- really good. Have you ever read any other Jane Austen before? No. You never have. This is my very first Jane Austen. You never had to read Jane Austen in school? No, I never did. Huh. Interesting. No. Um. So I know that I, the first time I read Pride and Prejudice was in between my sophomore and junior years of high school. Because it was like the assigned reading over the summer. And I hated it. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand who any of the characters were. I didn't really understand. I didn't really know anything about Jane Austen. So Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand like who they were and what the situation was that they were operating in. And I just thought it was the worst book in the world. Yeah. I thought it was terrible. 
and I went through the world for many years thinking that I hated Pride and Prejudice and that that made me like cool and edgy because everybody else really seemed to like Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in college, um, I'll never forget, (laughs) I had in my dorm room, my, my single dorm room, a little TV, like a... Um, one of those combination, this is going to show my age, it was a combination TV VCR um, thing and it had like a long antenna so I could pick up stations over the air, but the only station that I actually could get was I could get PBS and then sometimes I could get Fox, like I could get The Simpsons sometimes. Right. So I used to watch sometimes PBS in my room because that was the only channel I could get on this TV and one night they were showing like the 1940s... The, the Olivier, Olivier one, yeah. version, and the the one that's like for unaccountably like set in the 1860s, like all of the costumes are like Civil War era as opposed to like the 1790s. Okay, so I'm super happy that you said that because I watched the trailer for it today. Oh, did you? Because we didn't watch that version. No, for the we podcast. didn't watch that version. Um, we probably should have, but I watched the trailer today, and the entire time, like your your whole thing is costuming and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I tend not to pick up on that the way you do. Right. But I did pick up the entire time I was watching the trailer for it. I was thinking. Something looks wrong. This doesn't look right. So I'm super happy to hear that they changed the like era that it was in. Well, I don't need, yeah. I mean, I don't know that they did that intentionally or whether they were just like, we have these costumes left over from, uh, I don't know, Gone looks, with the Wind. It looks like Gone with the Wind. Yeah, I don't know. What year was Gone with the Wind? 1939. So like it may sure. literally have been the costumes from Gone with the Wind. Right. Anyway. That um, 1939 classic, Gone well, with the Wind. Well, the reason that I know that is because I know that Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz came out in the same year and I believe it was 1939. Right. But I could be super wrong about okay. that you're gonna look that up while i continue to speak go for it okay um so i remember saying and i i loved it i was like so into it i was like this is fun this is a cool plot and it's fun and funny yeah it was 1939 yay um it was like fun and funny and i liked the characters and i thought it was interesting and i said to my friend aaron never forget um shout out to aaron wow i think i really like pride and prejudice and she said wait a second if you liked that, you need to watch the 1995 version, which of course I then watched with her and was immediately obsessed. How did with. you watch it? I think we probably got either DVDs or VHS tapes from the library at school. Gotcha. Which is a very old fashioned statement. Yes. Yep. No, we did not have Netflix. Mm-hmm. We did not have Hulu. We did not have these newfangled ways of. Uh, streaming content. Mm -hmm. There was no streaming of any content whatsoever. This would have been 2003, 2004. Right. So I, um, my relationship to Pride and Prejudice will only take a minute to talk about because I really don't have much of a relationship to it. Mm -hmm. So my relationship also goes back to college, to my college friend, Andrea. Shout out to Andrea. So um, my friend, Andrea, the the one thing that I learned about her very quickly was that... um, there was a man that she was in love with. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a man she had never met. Mm-hmm. Who do you think that man was? Colin Firth. It was a. It was Colin Firth, and I, I only f- know that because you told me that the other day because we went to dinner with Andrea. Yeah, but also based on the context of what I'm saying, you could have figured it out. Right. Basically, what I knew was she was in love with Colin Firth, and what I found out was she was in love with Colin Firth because of the Pride and Prejudice miniseries. Right. But I still never watched it. Right. Um, and you, I mean, to, to make it brief, like you always told me, Pride and Prejudice is a great thing for like a, like a snowy day. Like uh, a, you mean the miniseries? The miniseries. Yes, I will always watch it like if I'm homesick from work. Exactly. Like if I'm feeling miserable and just want to lie on the couch, like mm-hmm. that is what I will turn on because it's six hours long mm-hmm. and it's great. Right. And it's really easy to watch. And so we picked it up last year and then at one point we had a snow day and I said, we are going to watch Pride and Prejudice and we watched it and I loved it. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's great. It's great. And we're going to get into like why it's great yeah i feel like the podcast isn't just gonna be yeah it's great everyone it's great. agrees everyone it's great watch it. go the podcast over that was short <laughs> you know it's great i know it's great everyone agrees it's great yeah pride and prejudice is great cool yep. so can we talk i mean i feel like this is going to be really interesting because in terms of adaptation i sure hope it's interesting well i mean i'm gonna find it interesting and our one listener is gonna find it interesting hi hi listener and the thing that really surprised me, because I have read the book before and I've definitely like seen the miniseries, the miniseries many times, I guess that I was under the impression 
that a lot of the dialogue was lifted pretty directly from the book. And sure, a lot of it is. But the thing that really struck me on this sort of read and watch through was how much dialogue wasn't lifted from the book because it couldn't have been lifted from the book because while the book, a lot of it really is written in conversations, there are so many places where it just sort of talks about what they said rather than explicitly word for word quotes how they said it. And so I feel like that's such a triumph of the screenwriter, Andrew Davies, um, to make it sound like to make people think, to make to make even people who are really familiar with the book think, oh yeah, this is dialogue that came straight from the book when it absolutely didn't. Um, so that that was my big revelation um, this time through. I don't know what you what you think about the dialogue. Well, no, I mean the dialogue. One thing I will say is I feel like we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Okay, I'm sorry. So no, no, hey, I here's the deal. I accept your apology. Thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, great. Um, because the way we're kind of presenting it, it almost sounds like we're going to talk about the '95 miniseries and then talk about the 2005 film as an adaptation of that. But let's talk about the book first. Okay, so let's talk about the book. Um, so give me the one minute version of this book. Give me the one minute version of it. Just like a plot summary. Please. Okay. One minute. So the Bennets have five unmarried daughters. Mm-hmm. They are landed gentry. Which as a Fiddler on the Roof fan really struck me, but yeah. go on. We're going to talk about Fiddler on the Roof at another time. Right. Um, they have a problem because they have no sons. And their estate has been entailed, which means that it can't be inherited by anyone who is female. Okay, he's looking at his watch. Uh, there's five daughters, and one of them falls in love with a rich guy, and one of them falls in love with another rich guy, and there's a bunch of machinations, and then at the end, they get married. The end. That's wonderful. I'm so happy about that. I feel like I can do a two-second summary, or I can do a 30-minute summary, but I can't do anything (laughs) in between. I think that's accurate. (laughs) So basically, so that's the book. So, as always, spoiler alerts. For if a you book haven't, that was literally written two hundred years ago. Uh, it was released two hundred and four years ago. Two hundred and four years ago. Yes, it was released. Yep. Yeah. Okay, eighteen. Eighteen thirteen. Eighteen thirteen. It was released in eighteen thirteen. That was a fact that I did not know. Yep. There you go. So, spoiler alerts abounding. Um, I don't think you even have to say spoiler alerts for something that was written in. I wanted to say spoiler alerts abounding though. Yeah. So basically, that that's that's the book. Um. I want to talk about the book for a little bit. Okay. I really liked it. Yeah, it was great. I really, really liked it. What did you like best about it? Okay, so I just really appreciated how the plot progressed. Mm -hmm. From a plotting perspective, I thought the book was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the way that it was pieced together. I love the way... So we were talking about this in terms of not about the specific adaptations that we were watching, but just in terms of how could you adapt it? Mm -hmm. What could you remove? Right, 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 right. There really isn't anything you can remove. Yeah, because you had asked me, the, the specific thing you said to me was, could you get rid of Mr. Collins? Exactly, could who we're going to talk character? about. Yeah. And I, well, maybe we should talk about who the characters are before I talk about who you could potentially cut. So who's the main character? Uh, the main character is Elizabeth Bennett. She kicks ass. She's great. Otherwise known as Lizzie Bennett. Yep, Lizzie Bennett. And it, she, yep. yeah, she, I mean, what what are three words you would use to describe Lizzie Bennett? Self-sufficient. Funny. Uh, brunette? I want to hear your words. <laughs> you just think she's brunette because you like Jennifer Ely. I like Jennifer Ely. She's really pretty. He has a proper crush on Jennifer Ely. I do. Um, I would say insightful. Yes, she is very insightful. Thoughtful. Yep. And... I have one more word for her. Prejudiced? She's a bit prejudiced. So this was a thing... So I, I, I actually think this is great. So um, maybe I shouldn't say this is great. One of the things that I did not appreciate... I certainly knew that Jane Austen wrote Pride and Prejudice. Right. I knew that she wrote Sense and Sensibility. She did. Which we will talk about in a future episode. Yes. I didn't realize that those words directly related to characters in the books. That is correct. They do. I didn't understand that. Right. So like Sense and Sensibility, one of the sisters is Sense and the other one is Sensibility. Didn't get that. So Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth is Prejudice and Darcy is Pride. Exactly. And I always assumed that these were just kind of very vague titles that described the feelings of people in the books. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize how specific they were. Ah. So that was something upon learning that I really appreciated. Mm-hmm. I liked that a lot. 
So we've got Elizabeth Bennet. She's our main character. She has a mother and a father. Yep. One thing about Elizabeth Bennet oh, that, that I didn't really understand is that the entire book is from her perspective. Yes. I mean, she it's is... not written in the first person. No, but every single scene... She's in. She is in. No, that's true. And mm-hmm. the, the reason that I know that um, very specifically... Can I put out a plug for my like own body of work here? Yeah, go for it. So I um, have done a lot of voice work with a site called LibriVox, which many people may have heard of if you're interested in free public domain audiobooks. And many people may not have heard of if you're not interested in if those things. If you're not. Um, but if you go to LibriVox and you look up the dramatic reading of Pride and Prejudice, I'm Lizzie Bennett. <laughs> there it is. So, <laughs> full disclosure. We like her. Full disclosure. Uh, I know a lot about what she actually has to say. Right. Because that is my voice. So Lizzie's our main character, mm-hmm. and then one of the other main characters is her sister Jane. Her sister Jane. So her Jane's, older sister Jane. Right. Jane's the oldest sister, Lizzie's second. Yes. And then she's got three younger sisters, who I think we'll talk about. Because there's so many characters, yeah. we have to, I think we have to talk some of, about some of the characters very briefly. Yeah, just talk but, about them quickly. But she does have three younger sisters. Mary's the middle sister. Mary's the middle. She is... Uh, Studious. Stick in the mud. Plain. Yep. She's not as pretty as her sisters. And in the 2005 version, just straight up goth. Honestly, I, I'm not even getting a mental picture of what Mary looked like in the 2005 version. We're going to get to what I'm talking about. Okay. So you got Mary, and then you have Kitty, Catherine. Kitty, and she's very um, flighty, and she's easily led. Yep. And, and then, then there's Lydia. And then there's Lydia, who is even flightier and even more easily led. Well, actually, no. I would say Lydia is really strong-willed, and she le- she's the one who leads Kitty around. That's, that's what fair. I meant by that. No, that's totally fair. But yeah. then I'm thinking about Lydia being led on by, some, by another character. Right. Well, we can get to that. Absolutely. So that's... So that's some of the ladies. Mm-hmm. And then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, abs- no, please. Uh, and then they have parents. Right. Both of their parents are Absolutely. living. Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Because when a man and a woman love each other very much. They have five daughters. Exactly. Because well, they're trying for a son. Right. Uh, and so Mrs. Bennett is very hysterical. And she is very interested in getting her daughters married to rich men. She's a very silly person. Yes. And Mr. Bennett is disgusted with everyone. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's great. Full disclosure, I loved him. Well, Lizzie is his... We see him really through... Like, as you say, the a lot of the book is from Lizzie's perspective, so I think we kind of see him through Lizzie's eyes a little bit. And right. He, she's definitely his favorite child. Right. I mean, I feel like if we had to break him down... If we had to pick one scene that exemplified him, mm-hmm. I think we would both pick the same one, and I think we'll get to it in a little bit. Cool. I'm sure we will pick the same scene. Cool. So, that's her parents. And then there's Mr. Bingley. There's Mr. Bingley. So... Yep. There are, there's this this group of very well-to-do, high-class people. Right. And one of them is Mr. Bingley. One of them is Mr. Bingley, and he has rented a house nearby. Right. So they're all very excited because a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. Which is a line from the book. The first line from the book. Exactly. It is a truth universally known that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. Which is the thing you just said. Right, but I didn't say the first part. There it is. I just quoted it. We don't want people to yell at us. I quoted it from memory. Right, exactly. I, I didn't. I, I didn't, hope it was accurate. I didn't read it. I'm trusting you. It was accurate. Yep. Hey folks, this is Arielle from the future. You just heard me get very smug about getting a line exactly word perfect. And it was not right, it was wrong. Here is the correct line. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. That said, I also got another line wrong later in the show, but I was not as smug about it. Thank you for listening, and I'm sorry. Okay, back to the show, everyone. Let's. I like this idea of taking a couple of words. Describe Bingley. Um. I, I have. I have a couple. Good natured. Delightful. Delightful. He is just friendly and optimistic. Kind. kind. He's just a great guy. Um, but naive. Exactly. Totally. And very easily influenced by his best friend. Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy, who is like the character. Can I ask you a question? Please. Do you know what Mr. Darcy's first name is? Fitzwilliam. I did not think you were going to know that. (laughs) Ha ha! Ha ha! Do you know what Mr. Bingley's first name is? No. I don't think they ever say. Dustin. Dustin? It's Dustin Bingley. (sighs) Devin? It's Devin Bing- Chad it, it, Bingley. It's Brayden. It is Brayden Bingley. It's Brayden Jaden Bingley. <laughs> is it Brayden Jaden Bingley? Yeah. Stop it. Um, no, um, what is no, his I first name? I actually have no idea. I don't think they ever say. Well, that you're putting me on the spot. Yeah, I was making a joke. Thank you for making me lie. 
Okay. So, so we've got these two guys, and they couldn't be more different. Uh, Bingley is great, and he's well, affable. He's not great. Huh? Wait, oh, Bingley, Bingley, yes. Bingley, no, I'm Bingley's. I'm so sorry. Bingley's affable and he's wonderful and everybody loves him, especially Jane. I mean, so basically Bingley and Jane. Bingley and Jane, and Jane fall in love. Bingley like, and Jane I fall in like love. I feel like that's, I feel exactly. like we can just say that. Exactly. But then you've got Darcy who is. Proud and haughty. Oh my God. Full, stuck up and stuck arrogant. Stuck up, arrogant, um, convinced that he's better than other people. We think. We are led to understand. Exactly. We're given to understand. Because it's all from Lizzie's perspective. Right. So we've got those two guys. And then there's, let's. I don't even think we need to go through individually. No, no, the no. People, I think I think that would take forever. There's one group of people that go along with them who are all very high class, very haughty. Um, Bingley has Bingley a sister. Has two sisters. Bingley has two sisters. Um, there's also a, a lady, Catherine de Bourgh. Oh well, she and comes. Her she's daughter. very important. We're gonna later. talk about her, but uh, there's there's Mr. Collins. Exactly. There's uh, Lizzie's friend, uh, Charlotte Lucas. Mm-hmm. And her dad and her sister. And I feel like Charlotte and Mr. Collins, they end up getting married. I don't think... it For what we're talking about, I want to get your opinion on this. For what we're talking about, I don't know how important they are. Well, I think Mr. Collins is important... If for no other reason than like people really enjoy him as a character, oh, no, so he's, I think he's super to funny. talk about the adaptation of his character, yes, because he was very different in the two movies that we watched. Right, exactly. So I think to just sort of give a line about who Mr. Collins is is important. Right. So who's Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins is a cousin of Mr. <laughs> That's been answered. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Mr. Collins is a cousin of Mr. Bennett, and the thing that makes him important is that he is actually the one the one who stands to inherit their house and their estate which is called Longbourn after Mr. Bennett dies so his wife and daughter because he never had a son something about the way that his father's will was written it's called entail I'm not familiar with English property laws of the 19th century so I don't know but what I'm saying is that the estate was entailed away and Mr. Collins is going to inherit his estate he's holding up his hands in a heart sign because he knows I can't help myself about explaining things I love you so much that was all I had to say. No, that's great. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I just wanted to say I didn't really understand if people think I'm going to go into what entailed means. I don't know other than it means that women can't inherit. Exactly. Property. Because, you know. Because of being women. Exactly. We all know. Because of vaginas. Okay, there it is. It means vagina. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, so Mr. Collins is like the comic relief for the entire thing. Charlotte Lucas is Lizzie's friend who ends up marrying him. Because he proposes to Lizzie and is rejected. Exactly. So that's the thing. I feel like when it comes to the plot, those are those are most of the characters. There are a good many of the characters. There are three characters that I can think of that we didn't talk about who are very important to the plot. Go for it. Mr. Wickham. Oh, yes. So he's the bad guy. In as much as there is a bad guy. For all intents and purposes, he's the bad guy. I guess guy. he's the bad guy. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you want to, if we really want to get specific with it, Lizzie's the bad guy. Explain. Be- because of all her prejudice. Yeah, but she... Re- she is her own antagonist. She reforms and but is no she's, longer prejudiced. But she is her own antagonist. Spoiler alert, she marries Mr. Darcy at the end. <laughs> spoiler alert. We're going to say spoiler alert a lot. So Mr. Wickham is great. We oh, think. he's great. He's so charming he's and handsome. handsome and fun and lighthearted and, and as good it, manners. And as it turns out, just a dick. Just a bad man. Yeah, he's a dick. He likes very young girls. He does like very... Well... Yeah. Well, yeah. No, he, he does. He tried to elope with a 15-year-old, and then he did elope with a 15-year-old. Yeah. A different 15-year-old. He he has a uh, he has a penchant for wronging people. <laughs> so Mr. Wickham is, that's one character who's very important to the plot. But then there's also the gardeners. Yes. I think the gardeners are great. So I think one of the things that, I want to get your opinion on this. Okay. I feel like Jane Austen must have known what she was doing. She created a group of characters, three that I can think of, uh-huh. who are just delightful and wonderful and loved, and there's nothing, there's virtually nothing wrong with them. Okay, so Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. And Mr. Bennett. And Mr. Well. Virtually nothing wrong. Oh, I he has, actually disagree really strongly he's, with that. He's got a, one or two big kind of things standing in the way of that, but at the end of the day, everyone loves Mr. Bennett. Okay. 
All right. I mean, I, I actually really disagree with that. So, okay. I, I mean, can't wait maybe, to hear why. Maybe we can talk about it. Yeah. So Mr. and Mrs. Gardner mm-hmm. are Lizzie's aunt and uncle. Yep. Um, it's her mother's brother and mm-hmm. his wife. Right. And they have, they're a little bit younger, I think, because they have like little children. Mm-hmm. But Mr. Bennett, like, yeah, he's, he's delightful. Yes. And, but he's kind of delightful in the same way that he's delightful and flawed. Yes. And part of his flaws are what makes him delightful. So I... I, I guess I would just, I, I'm not taking exception with you saying he's delightful. I'm taking exception with you saying that he's like one of these three perfect characters. Because he has a lot of flaws. You're absolutely right. So if I if I said perfect, that was the wrong word for it. Mm-hmm. Delightful and beloved. Beloved by Lizzie. By reader. Yeah, by Lizzie and therefore readers. Okay. All yeah. right. So... Let's just go through. Here's what I would love to hear. Mm-hmm. Let's just go through a few different scenes in the book that are just wonderful. Okay. I'd love to hear some of the some of your favorite scenes in the book. Okay. Because I have some favorite scenes as well. Okay. Well, they might overlap a little. Exactly. Bit. Um, but one of my favorite scenes is definitely. I mean, we can just jump right to it. Mm-hmm. Is that when Darcy proposes to Elizabeth? Yeah. When Darcy. So. I mean, basically, the entire thing about their relationship is that you have every indication that Darcy does not respect Lizzie and thinks very low of her. Because of her, not not because of her, because of her family. No, but she doesn't know that. She doesn't, well, she, yeah, I guess. Um, Until he proposes. Right. She just thinks he. He just thinks he doesn't like her. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And basically he proposes Mm -hmm. and he says, um, in vain I have suffered. It will not do. Mm-hmm. You must allow me to tell you how much I admire and love you. I just wonder if anyone's listening that they said that along with you. I hope they did. Exactly. I hope they did. Now, here's the thing that mm-hmm. actually shocked me the most of all on this reread and re-listen and rewatch. That's the only quote from the book. The rest of it is just a paragraph describing what he said to her. Yes. Um which was transformed in the visual mediums that we watched mm-hmm. into an actual speech. Which we will get into. Which we will get into. Totally. Um, but the reason that I think the scene, I mean, the scene is super important. Like, mm-hmm. it's the scene that everyone loves. It's very pivotal because it's the first time that anyone has said to Mr. Darcy, you being who you are is not enough for me. Mm-hmm. You also have to be... Be nice to me. Right. Yeah, because like just so, just to be clear, he proposes. He proposes. And she says no. And she says, no, you didn't treat me like, you didn't act like a gentleman towards me. Mm-hmm. And apart from that, you were the one that came between your friend, Mr. Bingley, and my sister. So how could I marry you knowing that you caused my dearest sister so much unhappiness? Mm-hmm. Like I could never, even if I wanted to marry you, I wouldn't because of that. Right. Um, And so... Darcy is being told, really for the first time in his life, hey, your actions have consequences. And you did something that your station in life and your position and your nobility and your family cannot overcome. You yourself took an action which is, which has had consequences for you in something that you want to do and now can't do. Mm -hmm. And no one's ever said that to him before, ever in his life. Um, and it really, uh, really affects him. Yeah. Um, it's, it, we it, find out later that we it find hugely out later, affects him. It hugely affects him. He, and I think that, I just think that's great. Like, I think that's a sign of his good character. Like, if you get called out on something, it's human nature to get, kind of get defensive. And he writes her this, like, long letter explaining his conduct towards her, towards Bingley and her sis, her sister, and also towards Mr. Wickham. Um... But, like, at the end of the book, he says, I thought I was really cool-headed when I was writing that letter, but I, I realize now it was written in great bitterness of spirit. Which like, I just read today, and I love that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that was actually something... everyone's had that experience. Well, that was the thing. So there's there's one aspect of this that I was really, really... I found very refreshing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say one quick thing about the 2005 ad- five adaptation, yeah, but not really about it. One of the things, one of the prevailing thoughts that I found when I was reading about it was... They wanted to make it accessible to a modern audience. Yeah, I've got thoughts on that. The, which we're going to talk about. Oh, we're going to talk about it. But this is one aspect that of a an older than 200-year-old piece of literature is completely accessible to a modern audience. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
Oh my God. In fact, I, I highlighted this. Yeah, go let ahead. Me, let me try to find this really quickly. When I wrote that letter, replied Darcy, I believed myself perfectly calm and cool, but I am since convinced that it was written in a dreadful bitterness of spirit. Dreadful bitterness of spirit. I love that phrase. I mean, here's the deal. I've written emails before as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you write it and then you delete it and don't send it. Exactly. It is the most modern thing in the entire book. Yeah. And it makes the entire thing work for any audience. It's, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And, and just the kind of... It makes you think the better of his character mm -hmm. because the kind of person that can get called out on something and sometimes you do flame up and get a little bit defensive but sure. if, but the kind of person that can then take a step back and reflect and go wow i need to make a change in my life mm -hmm. i was wrong right i was wrong and i need to make amends for being wrong it, it kind of takes sort of a, a greatness of mind to self-reflect when you're called out on something because a lot of times people just like shut down mm -hmm. especially you know, if they're in a moment of vulnerability and they get called out on something. Like, if you're proposing marriage to someone, that's that's pretty vulnerable, right? Like, yeah. I mean, of the two of us, you've proposed marriage to someone. Yes, to you. To me. Once. And you you were pretty convinced that of what the answer was going to be. Right. And you were still nervous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, it's a thing that makes... It feels very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and one of the things that I found really interesting about that scene is that it happens at exactly the halfway point of the book. Yeah, that I believe that. It is exactly halfway through. And I really feel like the book takes a huge turn at that point. Yeah, you would almost think that, like, Jane Austen knew what she was doing as a novelist. Almost. She's good. Apparently, she's good. She's pretty good. People she's all right. like her. She's all right. People like her. So, that that's a great scene. Um, yeah, you pick one now. So, my... Oh, my God. The scene that I... Could not I could not put the book down when I was reading this scene. You're was, so cute. Was Mr. Collins' proposal to Lizzie. Oh, so this is interesting because we're going to compare and contrast these two proposal scenes. Okay, so Mr. Collins is just a... D d d he's worthless. He's just an obsequious... Full of himself. Full of himself. He's a... He's a um... Sycophant. No, what's his actual position? Oh, he's a, a priest, a he's parish a pri priest. He's a parish priest. Yeah. yeah, exactly. A parson. A parson. That's the word I'm looking for. So he's a parson. He is... Okay, so one thing... There are two aspects of this that were a little weird for me as like a modern man. Uh, people who are related to each other would marry each other. I knew this was a thing, but still like it's there oh, yeah, and you it's weird. you could marry like up to first cousin. Exactly, which is weird, but okay, there it is. So he's Lizzie's first cousin. No, he's uh, not no, a first no, cousin. No, no, no. He's not no. even a first cousin. Like, he's, he's related, but like pretty distant. Right. So he's a distant cousin. He meets them. He is really interested in Jane, who's very beautiful. Yeah. She's the most beautiful. She's the most beautiful. He's very interested in her, but basically her mom says, oh, well, just so you know, uh, we really think she's going to marry this other guy, Bingley. Um, and he's like, oh, okay. Well, guess what? Lizzie's cute too. I'll take her. I'll take her. That's fine. So he proposes to her, and I don't want to ruin any of it. It is just delightful. The entire scene is amazing because it involves him proposing, her rejecting him. It involves her mom. It involves her family. Well, I, I also want to talk about sort of the modernity of this scene mm -hmm. because he is like what I wrote in my notes is Collins is the ultimate nice guy like capital yes. N capital G exactly nice guy yeah because he proposes marriage to her mm -hmm. he sort of lays it out logically like here are the reasons that I am going to marry you and right. I have decided that marriage is a good thing mm -hmm. and she kind of has to stop him and say just so you know you you haven't really waited for my reply and you know I'm very honored and everything but uh, I'm gonna have to say no Mm -hmm. and he... And then he straight up negs her. He straight up... Well, it's not even so much... The, I mean, he does neg her. He is... There is he, he absolute negging in the He literally says to her, scene. but no one... It, it's certainly possible that no one... You'll never get another offer of marriage. Mm -hmm. But he also does the thing that... I Not to make this gendered, but that capital N, capital G, nice guys do, which is he tries to explain to her her feelings based on logic. Mm -hmm. Um... So she says, I don't want to marry you because I am sure that I would not make you happy and I'm sure that you would not make me happy. And he tries to tell her why she's wrong um, using using facts and logic. Right. Um, and just reading through that scene. Which I did to you during our proposal. Did not because I didn't turn you down. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then you went, she said yes. No, he didn't do that. I just thought that was so modern. Like, that's so, like, this con, this sort of, like, internet concept of, like, this nice guy that feels like he's entitled to women's attention 
because of X, Y, and Z reasons that he's very happy to provide you. Right. Um, when, you know, the fact of the matter is like, dude, I just don't like you. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like you. I don't have to tell you. I don't have to have a logical argument and win with rhetoric about why I don't like you. I just don't want to date you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just felt like that aspect of Mr. Collins was extremely relatable to to the modern day. Absolutely. And that's one of the, that's the big reason why I love that scene. Yeah. Now, there's something that follows that scene, which is something I was talking about before, which has to do with Mr. Bennett, Mm -hmm. with her, with Lizzie's dad. Right. So there is one scene, there is basically one line of dialogue that I would point to as the Mr. Bennett line of dialogue. Okay. So uh, for, and I, I think you'll, I think you'll agree with me. Okay, go ahead. I think you know where I'm going. I think I do, but go ahead. So for the listeners, Mr. Collins has proposed, Lizzie has rebuked him, her mom is real mad, and she says, you've got to say yes. And she takes it to the dad. She takes it to Mr. Bennett and she says, I'm so mad at her, blah, 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 blah. And he looks at Lizzie, and I'm paraphrasing here, and he says, Lizzie, this leaves you in a predicament because after this decision, one of your parents isn't going to talk to you anymore. Because if you don't say yes to Mr. Collins, your mother will never speak to you again. But if you do say yes to Mr. Collins, I will never speak to you again. And at that moment, she knows that no one's going to force her to marry Mr. Collins. Exactly. And it's just a wonderful scene. Yeah, it's It's great. a really, really it's wonderful very, scene. It's a very, dad thing to say. Exactly. And it's, I think, such a strong scene that we're going to talk about the 95 version. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about the 2005 version. It's great in both. I, uh, lo- I love it in both. Yeah, Mr. Bennett is great in both. He's, he's just a really, really strong character who I think works in, in I, would, I would assume, works in most versions. Yeah. Even though there's a lot of... There's a lot of other versions of it that we we may cover it at another time. So that's that's a scene that I love. Yeah. That's a scene that I absolutely love. So do you want to talk about the 1995 miniseries? Yes, I would like to talk about that. Because we really enjoyed it. Yeah. And um, I kind of want to talk about... I mean, I'll just... Can I just say one thing really quickly? Yeah. I, I will... I'm totally willing to go on record. One of the best adaptations I've ever seen. Of anything. Of anything. Yeah, I buy it. Yeah. I buy it. Like, I don't well, think it can be understated just how strong it is. I mean, let's talk about that just as an adaptation. And I think the length is something that really assists mm-hmm. in that. Because Pride and Prejudice is not a super long book. Like, But as we talked about before, it's complex. It's complex. But what yeah. I'm saying is just in terms of actually getting all of the plot into it, mm-hmm. I'm not sure there's any major character or any element of the plot that was cut. And I say that as someone that sort of read a chapter, watched an hour, read a chapter, watched an hour mm-hmm. of that of that miniseries. Um, you're about to disagree, so tell me. No, 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 I'm not about to disagree. Oh, okay. Well, I guess technically. <laughs> Having just finished reading it today, yeah, there yeah. is only one section that is absolutely skipped, and that's the epilogue. Oh, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. But you're right. That's the thing about it is it really does follow. The plot is the plot. The plot is the plot. The plot of the miniseries is the plot of the book. Yeah. And so apparently sort of, you know, a sort of 300-ish page book you can do in six hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, a very character-driven 300-page book you can right. do in six hours. And one thing I want to say. Yes. Just to get it out of the way. I firmly believe that this story can be told well in two, two and a half hours. I firmly believe that. With, with, you would have to cut some stuff. You would have absolutely have to cut some stuff, but I absolutely believe it could be done well. Mm-hmm. I, we're going to get into whether it was done well in the 2005 <laughs> okay, but version. we're not quite there yet. But I firmly believe it could be done well, but because the miniseries has six hours, it really it has room to breathe. It doesn't cut anything. Exactly. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the casting. Yes. Um, so you said that this was one of the best adaptations yes. in existence. Mm-hmm. I think that the cast, as far as character for character, mm-hmm. as a representation of the characters from the book. Now, I want to give a caveat, because this adaptation is kind of how I was introduced to Pride and Prejudice. It seems like maybe it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation. Like, do I think of these characters as these actors? Because that's who I was picturing when I read the book. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sure. sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Like, do I picture Elijah Wood as Frodo every time? Yeah, absolutely I do. Mm-hmm. But they're so they're so perfect. Like, I, I really feel like the casting in this was so impeccable. Let me put you on the spot right now. Go ahead. Give me your top five people in the miniseries. Okay. 
Um, in no particular order. Allison Steadman is Mrs. Bennett. Is perfect. okay. She's great. She's perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the thing about Mrs. Benefit, Miss, Mrs. Bennett. Mrs. Bennett is broad. Yeah. It's a very broad, a broad character. character. And I feel like if the character is played too subtly, it doesn't work. Yeah. And if she's played, played too broad, then it doesn't work as well. Yeah. I really agree with you. I think she's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to be hard to give a top five because I think everyone is perfect. Top fives are hard. Um, Colin Firth. Colin Firth. I said this to you the other day. What did I say to you the other day? You said... You couldn't think of many more situations where an actor was so perfect for a role. Exactly. I really think he is that perfect for it. Yeah. I cannot imagine. Anyone else doing it is just trying to do something that might be as good as Colin Firth doing it. Yeah. And I yeah, fe- yeah, yeah. and because of that, I feel bad for any other actor that's doing it. Right, right, right. Yeah, but I think he is amazing. Yeah. He'd be in my top five. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I said, Miss- I said Allison Steadman. I said Colin Firth. I'm going to say... Mm-hmm. Uh, Anna Chancellor as Miss Bingley. Sure. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Just looking down her nose and sneering in such a perfect way, but like so under that guise of manners. Um, I will say, super interesting. This came out the same year as Four Weddings and a Funeral, where mm-hmm. she played the exact same character. Right. Just in modern times. Um, she's she's duck face in Four Weddings and a Funeral, if anybody knows that movie. Right. Um, she just has that sort of air to her. She also kind of plays the same character in Tipping the Velvet, but we don't need to talk about that quite yet. Um, no, by all means, let's spend, just so everyone knows, the next hour is going to be Tipping the Velvet. I mean, I would that would be delightful for me. I, I don't even know what that is. You don't know what Tipping the Velvet is? No, but We're we'll save it. We're going to talk later off air. So Anna Chancellor, you think Anna Chancellor's great? Anna Chancellor's great. I don't want to, I'm going to get controversial here. Go for it. Susanna Harker as Jane. Mm-hmm. Now, I've heard people say that she does not work as Jane because she is not as pretty as Jennifer Ely. Mm-hmm. And Jane is supposed to be the prettiest sister. But to them I say, incorrect. Incorrect. <laughs> to them you say, no, you are wrong. You are wrong, and here is why. <laughs> okay. Jennifer Ely is beautiful in the modern style. Mm-hmm. So we... in. 2017 look at her and go that is a beautiful woman and she is a beautiful woman she is she's but part of her beauty particularly in this movie is that she's kind of spunky and she's got brown hair not blonde hair and she's fun and she has like a little bit of a twinkle in her eye and jane is much more sedate and quiet and she has very noble features she's very noble features and that's why she was cast based on the standards of beauty for that time. So she looks like a Greek statue, mm-hmm. and that's what was considered the most beautiful. Blonde and kind of like solid features, and she has kind of like a, a, a Roman nose and like very big eyes, and she's she's just very, very beautiful in that like Greek classic style. Right. Um, and... That that's part of the reason that I buy into the people who created this adaptation being clicked in with the book because they're they're really thinking about what would it what would it have been like in this time? Mm-hmm. What how would people have behaved? How would they have looked? How would they have treated each other? How would they have talked to each other? Um, they they were really going for an accuracy of style, I guess, um, which when we contrast it, when we come to contrast it to 2005 is right. very different. Yes. Okay, so I've said four four people, mm-hmm. and um, I think, honestly, I'm just going to go ahead and say Jennifer Ely. She's, she's perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, she's, she's perfect. great. Yeah. She's great. If I was doing my top five, yeah. it would include several of yours mm-hmm. um, because Colin Firth and Jennifer Ely are amazing. It's one of, you know, we talk a lot about chemistry, Mm -hmm. two actors having chemistry. Yeah. They have chemistry and yes, there is an attraction and there's that aspect of chemistry, but their chemistry works on every single level. Yeah. Their chemistry works when they, when she hates him, their chemistry works when they love each other. Right. It's really, really wonderful. She's great. What I didn't realize until you told me, I didn't realize that she is not British. Um, well, at least not strictly. If you think she's someone who was born in Britain and lived her entire life in Britain. That is not true. That is not true. Yeah, I believe she spent 
her teenage years like in North Carolina or somewhere like this. Right. She's she's absolutely wonderful. Um, I her she's her. Someone's gonna write in and correct me on that. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Please write in. Um, I I think she's incredible. This she has one of the her voice is really sexy. And wow. I Told you that. Uh, she's amazing. Wow. She, I, have a, I have a proper crush on Jennifer Ely I in mean, this movie. I mean, she does have a lot of boobs going on in this movie. Everyone does, and that's the dresses. That is not the well, thing. No, I. I mean, it kind of is the thing. I could just close my eyes and listen to her for hours. That's. And then you would open them and see. Never mind. Yeah, okay. There it is. <laughs> There's so, a lot of cleavage in this movie. Yeah, but it was like 200 years ago. Yeah. So she's wonderful. Colin Firth is wonderful. I think Bingley is fantastic. Oh, he's great. Yeah, he might have been like my number six. Yeah, and he's a Bonham Carter, by the way. But like a distant, he's like a third cousin to Helena Bonham Carter. Right. Um, but he he is... Crispin Bonham Crispin Carter. Crispin Bonham Carter. Name. He's absolutely wonderful. Um, those are a couple of the people that I would, I would put in mind. Yeah. He's just got these like big wide blue eyes and like curly hair. He's just so adorable. Mm -hmm. Like you just want to squeeze his face. He is so wonderful in this movie. So casting is a huge part of this. Casting was something that they just, they destroyed the casting on this. They did such a good job. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, just like a note quickly on costumes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're great. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about them other than I think they really, really express who the characters are really well. Like, Mrs. Bennet and Lydia are always wearing something a little more floofy and feathery than the other girls. They dress very sedately. Jennifer, or, um, I was going to say Jennifer, uh, Lizzie always has like a little cross necklace on like with little rubies in it that I Mm -hmm. always notice um and one thing I read I don't know if you saw this when you watched like the behind the scenes extras but one thing that I read about the way that they made this movie or this miniseries was they actually shot it in order so the seasons were correct as they as they because it takes place over like 18 months or two years right and so the seasons were correct as they were shooting because they shot pretty much in order. And also the other thing that I read about the way that they handled the costumes was that each um, actress was sort of given a couple of dresses, like as many dresses, like three or four dresses, like just as many as they would have had. And for every scene, they were kind of allowed to just choose what they wore, just like you would if you woke up and chose what to wear, what to wear on that day. So right. they had like certain dresses that they would wear in a scene that they felt like they wanted to dress up and look pretty and like certain dresses that they would choose like if there was a scene where they had to go for a walk or something like that. But they were sort of each had like, because it sounds like the filming schedule is pretty long and drawn out. So they had like a closet of dresses that they were just allowed to go to and choose from. And I just think that's really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, so the costuming is a big part of yeah. it. Yeah. And you want to talk about the writing. So let's talk about the writing of it. So Andrew, I think it's Davis. No, it's D-A-V-I-E-S. Davis. I, un- I understand that's how it's spelled, but I think some people I heard pronounce it Davis. Okay. So I've only will... ever heard Davies before. I know. So here, this is not me correcting you. No, no, no. This is me asking our listener. If right in. You, if you know, please let us know. Right but in. let's say Davies. Okay, fine. We're going to say Davies. Um, this was something that I found interesting. And it's hard for me to put it in context now without talking about the 2005 version. But I'm going to try. The script for the miniseries is, I think, impeccable. Mm-hmm. I think he did a truly wonderful job. To your point before, so much of the dialogue that you assumed was in the book that you heard in the miniseries is not, in fact, in the book. Yeah. He did such a wonderful job doing, I would say, two things as far as dialogue goes. Creating dialogue that sounds like it's from the book. Yeah. And also giving certain lines that were not dialogue to characters. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what's the first line of the book? It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. So this is a line written by the omniscient narrator. Which he gives to a character. Who does he give it to? He gives it to Lizzie. Exactly. Of course he gives it to Lizzie. In the first scene of the, bo- of the movie. Exactly. It's one of the first lines she has. Yeah. I'd have to rewatch it. It might even be the first line I think it might actually has, be her first line. Which is brilliant. Yeah, it's I great. think it's absolutely brilliant. It's very meta, mm-hmm. you know, for people that know the book. Like, um, yeah. It's, it's perfect. It's great. So on a dialogue standpoint, it's wonderful. He makes some choices that I think are just wonderful. And there are some things that I found out about the way he wrote it and the things he wrote in stage directions that I found interesting for this pers- from this point. He's a guy. He's a man. He is a man. 
writing this book, writing the, the screenplay of the book written by Jane Austen. A woman. About many women. Exactly. From a woman's perspective. This, so the, the book passes the Bechdel test. It sure does. So this was something that Andrew Davies said uh, specifically about writing it. He acknowledges the fact that when Jane Austen was writing, and this is something she said, mm-hmm. all of the scenes are either between multiple women with no men women with a man there's always a woman present oh in i've every heard this scene. about jane austen before because she wouldn't have known what men say to each other when they're alone exactly yeah i've heard that said about jane austen before and andrew davies knew this and said well i know so i'm going to make aspects of this miniseries done from a man's perspective right because there's a scene the, the very first scene actually is mm-hmm. like bingley and darcy riding up to netherfield and talking about Bingley purchasing the house. Exactly. Or renting the house. And this works for a couple of different reasons. One is what we were just talking about. He wanted to write scenes that were from a man's perspective. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is he intentionally made that the first scene because anyone who loved the book watching it would immediately know this is going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. He didn't want... This isn't a scene straight from the book. Exactly. He didn't want to be too precious with everything. That. I as an ad, as an adapter, mm-hmm. I appre- I think it's wonderful. I absolutely respect his decision to do that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that Andrew Davies talked about is he really wanted to sexualize the story. Mm. He really wanted to make it oh, sexy. Yeah, the scene between Lydia and Wickham. You mean? No. Oh, okay. Go ahead. What are you talking about? I'm talking about this scene because this scene is not in the. No, book, that's true. Where yeah. they're in like the lodgings in London after they've run away together, and mm-hmm. she's kind of like lounging and she's very sexy, and she's like kind of like touching him, and she says, "What?" I want to add someone to my top five. Okay. Julia Sawal oh, is amazing. Great. Yeah. She's amazing. She was 27 when she's, this was filmed. You, she was you told me. She's 15. She's older than she's Lizzie. She's older than Lizzie. Yeah. She, the actress is older. And she's playing the youngest daughter. She's amazing. Sorry I interrupted. No, this, and, and I assume this is part of what he was talking about. There's a scene that is completely not in the book that she has, she's 16, 15 or 16. She's run away. She has eloped with Wickham. They have not married yet. So it's Mm -hmm. really scandalous. Mm -hmm. And she says something to the effect of, to think that I have done what none of my sisters have and I'm the youngest. Um, Meaning sex. Yeah. She's had sex. Right. Yeah. So I want to give you a couple of different things from Andrew Davies' perspective relating to this topic. Yeah. Some things that I have learned. Okay. First of all, the, the biggest scene that everyone thinks about is um, essentially Lizzie is on vacation with her aunt and uncle. They visited Pemberley. Pemberley. Which is Darcy's estate. That is Darcy's estate. It's big and it's wonderful. He is not there. They're taking a tour of it. Then Darcy arrives. Now in the book, he just is suddenly there. <laughs> but in the miniseries, Darcy arrives. We see him arrive. And you know, it's a hot day. And he says, I'm going to go for a dip. So he ju- he strips down he's a all bit. Wet and naked. He's not even naked. He's he, naked. He strips down to a long sleeve undershirt. No, no, he strips down naked, and then you see him in his shirt because he's put it back on. No, he goes swimming in his clothes. Mm. I just watched it. All right. Sorry, he goes swimming in clothes. Do you think I'm imagining Colin Firth's nudity? Yes. I made that up out of whole cloth. Hundred percent. Because I wanted it so badly. Yes. So he strips down as much as someone can strip down in a BBC miniseries. Right. Jumps into the water. And when he bumps into Lizzie, he is still wet and his shirt is clinging to him. And it's, here's the deal. Is he wearing pants at the time? Yeah. He's not pantsless. No, he's not pantsless. He's he's, he's got bottoms and and a top. Breeches. Yeah, exactly. In the context of the world that they are in... He is essentially naked. Yeah, yeah. He's like naked. And it's real sexy. Yeah. So that scene, not in the book. That was something Andrew Davies added. Another thing he added. There's a very short scene in the miniseries when Darcy is getting a bath. Mm. And one of his manservants, and he is f- fully naked. I think I probably conflate these two yeah, scenes yeah. in my mind. So he's naked, he's in like the copper tub, and his manservant is bringing in water and everything. This is a scene that is not in the book at all. Right. But Davies was like, no, I need people to understand that Darcy's pretty sexy, and so I gotta put that in. Yeah, there's also a scene where he's fencing. Yes. Oh, and I forgot about know that. what fencing means. It, yeah, because I mean, some kind of penis metaphor, obviously. I mean, there's some phallic. Well, here's injury. the deal. If we're gonna talk about that, then I'm gonna talk about the last one. So, okay. there is a scene that Andrew Davies decided from his writing of the screenplay, of the teleplay, 
was the scene when Darcy first developed feelings for Lizzie. Okay. So, quick uh, plot backstory. Um, Bingley lives near the Bennets. He's got his estate that he's just purchased. And his sisters live there. And they have invited Jane, Lizzie's older sister, to come join them. Mm-hmm. She arrives. It's raining. She gets sick. She, they say, hey, she's got to stay here because she's sick. And Lizzie says, I am going to go to her because I love her and Lizzie's great. Lizzie decides she's not going to take a horse. She's not going to take a carriage. She's going to walk the three miles. So she arrives. She's covered in mud. Her cheeks are flushed. She's tired. And she happens upon in the yard, she happens upon Darcy. In the script, this is the stage direction. Darcy sees her, cheeks flushed, covered in mud, and he gets an erection. Oh. Full on. That is in the script. Oh, no. Now, the way Andrew Davies... Oh, no. I know. Now, the way Andrew Davies puts it, that is not... See, he said specifically, this was not scene direction for the cinematographer. It was for Colin Firth. It was for Colin Firth. It was... I feel like Colin Firth, based on what I know of him, would really have taken joy in that stage direction. Exactly. I really... I think that is, on its face, gross... It is super gross. But here's the deal. Is that the scene where she's playing with the dog? No, this is when she's just walked up. Like when he sees her, she, there's like a giant dog and she is like playing no, with it with a stick. That's later. Oh, okay. That's totally that's later. That's really cute when she plays that's with That's a dog. different time. Oh, okay. Cute dog. Dog's probably dead now. I mean, I'm sure it's dead. Yeah. That's a game we could play. Is this dog dead? I mean, it's a great Dane and they don't live very long. They this don't. Was like this was 20 years ago. Many years ago. Yep. So basically, there's this scene. Andrew Davies decided this is the moment when Darcy first becomes attracted to Lizzie. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, the way that Davies puts the proposal scene, that scene, the way he wrote it, he's not saying this is the way he interpreted it from Jane Austen. This is the way he wrote it. Darcy is proposing to Lizzie because he wants to have sex with her. And in a man, a man of his position, this is the only way where he could legitimately have sex with this woman is right. if they're married. Right, which I feel like is just a thing. Exactly. Like, that's why a lot of people got married. But that is what Davies brought to this project. I want to give a quick background on Davies just so people know who he is. Yeah. He wrote everything. Oh my God, everything. In fact, I'm pretty sure he wrote the screenplay to Tipping the Velvet, to which I earlier referred. We would have to check on that. We could check on that. Yeah. Um, pause. All right, so here's a few things that Andrew Davies has written. House of Cards. Yep. The British House of Cards. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, the original House of Cards. He is like, he is the writer writer. of House of Cards. Yeah. Um, Northanger Abbey. Anger. Is it Northanger? Northanger. Well, I am embarrassed. I mean, we can go back. No. I, I, I don't want me correcting you on the podcast. Well, it's here. Especially because I'm not 100% sure I'm right. <laughs> Bleak House, Tipping the Velvet. Yeah! Dr. Zhivago. And these are all the TV versions of these. Vanity Fair. I mean, this is Pride and Prejudice, He's Middle March. He's in every adaptation. This is tons He's of adaptations. Um, actually, now that I look at it, wait a second. He's listed for the American House of Cards. Maybe he was like a consultant. Maybe. Or maybe they sort of had to credit him because it was his idea. Wow. Yeah, we'd have to look at that a little bit. So basically, he did the original adaptation of House of Cards for BBC. Mm-hmm. Another adaptation. Andrew Davies is great. He's, he's, pretty, he's pretty great. And he knows what he's doing. Even though, on its face, some of the things he says can be a little bit creepy. I, I think... And I would need to have this looked up. And mm-hmm. I don't know if this informs any of his writing or any of his sort of ideas about human sexuality. I believe Andrew Davies is a gay man. I, I, oh, I, we I, have I, to... I don't want to say I don't want to say that assuredly. No, nope, we've got to check that right now. Okay. Pause. Okay. So Andrew Davies is gay. And I want to say how I found it out because it's a bummer. Oh no! This is the headline of the article from <laughs> WalesOnline.co.uk. Oh, okay. Andrew Davies gives shocking account of homophobia, claiming his cat was killed because he was gay. No! Wait, he was gay or the cat was gay? <laughs> <laughs> I think we are unfairly making light of something that is really horrifying. His cat? What? Um, he runs a group promoting Wales. Les- wait. Hang on. It's a totally different Andrew Davies. Oh, that's... Okay, well, now, if it's a different Andrew Davies, don't even look at it, because it's totally irrelevant and it's bumming you out. I'm trying to see. Oh, my God. 
Don't don't read about the cat. We would have to look into that a little bit. I don't know if that's an assumption you can make. Okay. I, I don't think it's an assumption. I think it's something that I've read, but definitely okay. tweet at us if we're wrong. Please, please, absolutely. And I don't I'm not gonna say that informed anything one way or the other. I'm just saying mm-hmm. he's remarkably insightful about women. Exactly. And Sir Andrew, if you're listening, all Is British men are, are all British men are sirs, aren't they? We'll talk about that later. When you reach a certain age, aren't you automatically a sir? No. Oh. All right. Well, Mr. Andrew, please tweet at us. I think it's Mr. Davies. Whatever, Mr. Andrew. It's, it's not totally royalty. fine. Mr. Davies. That was the thing that just messes me up with this entire. You know what? We're going to get into this in a second, but the way everyone's called Mr. Bennett, Mr. Darcy, Mr. Wickham, yeah. it's a whole thing that I had to get wrap my head around. And it's the whole class system side of it, which I we'll mean, get into in a minute. It's just Mr. I mean, you could be Mr. Yeah, but that's not a thing. It's not a thing for me. All right. All right. So I feel like. This is a good transition point. I feel like we have said oh, the main things that we can about say about movie. the miniseries. Bottom line, it's wonderful. We love it. Yeah. Let's talk about this movie. Oh, so this movie, this is one of those things that I love. The movie came out closer to the miniseries than it did to today. Oh, yeah. Because 2005. Yeah. Okay, couple things about the miniseries. Sorry, the movie. The movie. So the movie um, was uh, made in 2005. It's got Kira Knightley. It's got Kira Knightley. Who Ooh, was, oh, I'm sorry. You said she won an Oscar. She did not win. She was nominated. Never said she won. I said she was nominated. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I must have misunderstood you then when we you were You did misunderstand, I'm and you sorry. misrepresented me to all of these people. Wow. Yep. No, uh, Kira Knightley was nominated for an Oscar. Yes. We can talk about whether we think she deserved that or not She later. lost to Reese Witherspoon in Walk the Line. It was a really good movie. It was real good. She Reese Witherspoon was really good. I mean, you always win the Oscar if you play a real person. That's how it works, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, 2005, it was directed by Joe Wright, who has gone on to do a number of different things. Um, He directed Pride and Prejudice. Now, this is important. This was his first movie. Oh. This was his first movie. He did Atonement. He did The Soloist. He did Hannah, Anna Karenina. He did Pan a couple of years ago, that really weird Peter Pan, the one with Hugh Jackman in it. I didn't see it. No one did. Okay. It was not received well. I haven't seen any of these movies. Um, But anyway, he is a guy who I think was really viewed as someone who was very up and coming Mm -hmm. and really has carved out a niche niche for himself. Um, This was his first movie, though. So I think that's important to say. Yeah. It was... Uh, yeah, I mean, do you want to talk about it from a filmmaking standpoint? Because you, there were things about it that I think you really appreciated. There were things that I appreciated about it. Um, just a couple other little things about its production. Uh, and specifically about what we're talking about, it was also written by Deborah. I'm going to go ahead and guess here. Mogash. Spell it. M-O-G-G-A-C-H. Yeah. It might be Mogak. Mogak. I think... But I'm not sure. Okay. I have certainly listened to a few of her interviews, but no one had the decency to say her actual name. <laughs> so it's 2005. It's a personal affront to you. Exactly. It's I just don't appreciate it. Help me, help, help me out a little bit. <laughs> so this came on the tail end of uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the Bos Lerman film. It came on the tail end of Shakespeare in Love. Yeah, there was really kind of a period sort of late 90s early 2000s where we as a society thought modernizing the classics was a really good idea we had to make them sexy yeah like even like 10 things i hate about you i would put in that category like all of these sort of teen modern adaptations of shakespeare there's a lot of them from sort of that era of time except i love that movie i'm not saying it's a bad thing and also the only reason that anyone knows where i went to college is because of 10 things i hate about you exactly where'd you go to college i went to sarah lawrence there it is so this came at the tail end of that. They wanted to sex it up a little bit. They wanted to make it accessible to a, a younger audience. I think it's really important that we say a few things about that we liked about this movie. So I'll start. Okay. Because you might not have any. I don't have any. You, you while I'm saying while I'm talking, you think about it because I bet you'll <laughs> I, you, I bet you'll have at least one. Okay, go ahead. So first of all, this is Joe Wright's first movie. One thing I really appreciated appreciated about it is from a filmmaking perspective, it's very intentional. It's very intentionally shot. It's clear that he was thinking about every shot throughout the movie. This isn't the kind of movie where they just set up the camera and shot the actors. I think it is shot in a very interesting way. Sometimes it works to its benefit, sometimes it doesn't. But I really appreciate the way the movie was shot. I think it is a beautiful movie. I really love the way it looks. Okay. That's one thing that I really liked about it. Okay. 
Another thing I really liked about it was Donald Sutherland. I was going to say, there's one character, one actor that you really liked. Well, there's one that I loved and another one I really liked. Okay. The one I really liked was Donald Sutherland. Okay. Now, he plays Mr. Bennett. Now, here's the thing. If I was also making a list of five things I didn't like about the movie, Donald Sutherland as Mr. Bennett would be on there. How about the fact that I couldn't understand what he was saying half the time? That's my problem. (laughs) Donald Sutherland is wonderful. I love him. But he plays it very subtle. And you cannot understand him I half mean, the Donald time. I mean, Donald Sutherland is a mumbler in the best of circumstances. Exactly. I don't know that Jane Austen dialogue is the thing you want to be putting in Donald Sutherland's <laughs> mouth. But as far as finding an emotional core for the character of Mr. Bennett, he does it. Mm-hmm. And I love him in it. Yeah. I really, really love him in it. I was saying this before. Your mother will never speak to you if you don't marry him. I will never speak to you if you do. And I'm paraphrasing. You Obviously, liked, I'm paraphrasing. You liked that scene. He killed that scene. It was fantastic. He's great. I loved him in that scene. And certainly later, in the, at the end of the movie, when Lizzie goes to him and says, yes, I want to marry Mr. Darcy. And he goes, why? You hate him. And she explains why. Donald Sutherland, it's the only version of it that I've seen where Mr. Bennett actually starts crying a little bit Aww. because his daughter is going to get married. And it's, it, it made me cry. It was wonderful. He's, he's great even when he's not. Yeah. So that, that's a big thing. And there. then there was the implication at the end that M- Mr. and Mrs. Bennett were going to do, 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 the, do the business. <laughs> do the thing that got them five daughters in the first place. <laughs> I don't remember that. No, I do remember that. Yeah, was, yes, you do yeah. remember that because I turned to you and said, oh. are they going to bone? Oh, right. And then I turned to you and I said, gross. Yeah. So anyway, moving on. <laughs> so those are some things I liked about it. I will say... The daughters. Yeah. I liked Kira Knightley. I didn't like Kira Knightley. Didn't love Kira Knightley. I liked her. I didn't like her. We're going to talk about some of the things we didn't like, and a lot of that stuff affected how I felt about her role in the movie. Uh huh. But her performance, I could get behind. Uh huh. Choices made by the writer and director, I could not. Yeah. But I don't really want to fault Kira Knightley for that. Okay. But I will say. I'm trying to think right now about anything else about the movie. It was beautiful. Donald Sutherland's great. No, I'm going to get to my number one right here. Okay, go ahead. Tom Hollander. (laughs) Yeah, you liked him. So Tom Hollander plays Mr. Collins in this movie. Now, this is funny because you were talking before about how you saw the miniseries. And yeah, it's hard to read the book and not picture all the people from the miniseries. Right. The second I started reading the book and the second Mr. Collins comes on, this obsequious, annoying guy... There was only one person that I pictured in my head. Tom Hollander. Nope. Who? Stephen Fry. Yeah. Oh, because we talked about this a little we bit. We talked about this. Because Stephen Fry actually does kind of play this character in a couple of other movies. Exactly. Yeah. I immediately pictured Stephen Fry, who I have not seen play this character ever. I don't mean this character. I mean a similar character. No, 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 no. Like, no, he, like what... he plays the sort of obsequious guy right. who is in love with someone unrequitedly in Cold Comfort Farm, exactly. for example. Um, and he's very obsequious also in Gosford Park. Exactly. So I immediately pictured him. Now, the actor that plays this character in the miniseries is very good. Mm-hmm. But the actor that plays him in the movie, I think, is perfect. Now... In order for me to talk about why I think he's so perfect, I have to talk about things I didn't like about the movie. Right. Because the thing that I said about Mr. Collins Mm -hmm. is, because you said to me, I think this guy's great. And I said, yeah, but he's in a different movie than everybody else. And I said, yeah, but I like the movie he's in. (laughs) That's the big, one of the big problems I have with this movie is that the tone of it is totally inconsistent throughout the entire movie. Oh my God. All of the characters feel like they are in different versions of the story. They're either in very subtle versions of the story or they're very broad versions of the story. Mm-hmm. Donald Sutherland goes back and forth. It's it's a whole, it's just a whole thing. Right. Tom Hollander is, I think, the strongest actor in the entire movie. He is perfect. From the second he walks on screen to the second he leaves screen, he is absolutely perfect. If everyone was performing at the level that he was and was performing that style of character... I think I would have liked this movie a lot more. Mm -hmm. I think he is absolutely wonderful, and I think it's worth watching for him alone. Okay. Uh, I really think he's wonderful. That's fair. And and that's all, I mean, you know, I don't want to, these are like, these are good actors, Mm -hmm. and I think that they were directed terribly, like in terms of their performances. So I don't know, I don't know a lot about movie making, so I don't know how much the director 
ha- the director's craft goes into the performances of the actors as opposed to like setting up the shot because you were talking about how beautiful some of the sh- and interesting some of the shots are. Mm-hmm. I know a little bit more about theater directing as far as how much of the director goes into what the performances are. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Well, I mean, anytime we're talking about acting, we're talking about two things. We're talking about casting, we're talking about direction. Right. So casting lays on the feet of the producers and the director. Right. 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 So for those decisions, I think they cast wildly, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Disparate. Disparate, inconsistent, inconsistent actors. I really think the casting of this was not on point. They cast a lot of wonderful people, but half of them should have been in one version of the movie and the other half should have been in another version of the movie. Yeah. I really don't think they did a good job. Case in point, I want to pick one one actor who was cast and the way they were directed that I think is a perfect example of the failings of this movie. That's fine and I want you to do that, but then I also actually want to talk about why I think Keira Knightley was miscast. Why don't you talk about that first? Okay. Um, so you really liked Keira Knightley, and I agree with you that she is, she exhibits a lot of the characteristics of Lizzie Bennet. Mm-hmm. She's kind of bright-eyed, she's smart. She's kind she's of a tomboy. Kind of a tomboy, she's witty, she's sprightly. Um, Keira Knightley, and I, God, I don't know what it is about, I don't know if it's her, I don't know if it's the way that she's directed, I don't know if it's something as simple as like her hairstyle I don't buy her as someone living in 1810. She is so modern. I don't, she, to me, she is just not a period actress. She has such a modern face. I mean, she did Anna Karenina and I didn't buy her in that. So I don't know if it's just something about her that just something about her face or the way that she speaks or her acting style or something she to me she's just not a period actress she just takes me out of it so completely i i think what we're talking about right now is the direction okay i think we're talking about the script and we're talking about the production and the direction but i i felt that way about her in other things too sure sure absolutely and i'm not saying she's a bad actress i'm no. saying she she doesn't she, she she's not a period actress to me I, I it just seems like i can't buy her in anything before modern times except for pirates of the caribbean well that's that's heightened it's a period piece, and she's a delight. I, actually, I think she's pretty modern in that, too. But everyone is, and it's a delight. Well, there you go. Okay, I mean, Who, what was the one cast that, what were you about to say? I was going to talk about Mr. Bingley. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Here's the thing about Mr. Bingley. We described him before. He's affable. He's positive. He's, he's optimistic. naive. He's sweet. Would you describe him as stupid? Yeah. Um. No. I mean, in this movie, yes, he's just stupid. He's just dumb. <laughs> He's just a big dummy. I do really like his hairstyle. It, excessively modern hairstyle. No, his his hairdo is something I would wear. I know, but that's <laughs> this is 200 years this ago. This is what I'm saying. And he's a gentleman. Right. He's portrayed in the movie as just a simpleton. Yeah. He is he is simple. Yeah. And because of how simple they portray him, I don't care. Yeah, and I and, don't care about him at all. And one of the things you said to me that I really thought was very very apt was that you never saw anything of Mr. Bingley trying to be a good influence on Darcy where you do see that in the 1995 miniseries like when they're at the ball and Bingley's like Darcy you're acting stupid you need to come and dance you need to you need to behave like you're in civilized society like why are you acting this way why are you being so particular um that Bingley really feels like he's exerting a good influence on Darcy just as much as Darcy's in exerting a good influence on Bingley. And you don't see that. He's just an idiot. You don't see any reason why Jane would be attracted to him or want to marry him. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he is horribly miscast and just the entire idea of who the character is is wrong. Right. And before we before we get into the major problem with it, which I want to hear from you, mm-hmm. there are just a couple more people I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, go for it. We've talked about Kira Knightley. I want to talk about two people in particular. Really, I mean, I guess three. We need to talk about Darcy. Yeah, I guess we do. Matthew McFadden. I suppose we do. I like Matthew McFadden Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. as an actor in other things. I do not care for him in this movie. God, he's just not Darcy. He's, that's the thing. And is he not Darcy because he's not Colin Firth? Yeah. I don't think so. No, I, 
I mean, it's hard for me to divorce the two in my mind. Mm -hmm. But I I, I think, you know, if I'm being truly honest and not just being a Colin Firth fan, Mm -hmm. no, I just don't think, I just don't think, I just, in this adaptation, I just don't think we get to know enough about him. Yeah. To know whether he's Darcy or not. Exactly. I, I think that it just, he doesn't work in this. I don't think it's his fault. I, I don't. I never blame the actors for not working in something. I, I blame the producers and the director. To work with. Yeah. So, Matthew McFadden. Uh, I feel bad for the guy. He's he's good. I like him in other stuff. Death at a Funeral, super funny. He's really good at that. It really good in that. So that's one. Rosamund Pike is an actress. I think is great. I really like Rosamund, but she's Jane. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, that's not Jane. No. The version of Jane she plays is not Jane. Yeah. That is not Jane from the book. It's a completely different character, which speaks to an issue that I think we're going to get into. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I won't and get then, into it quite yet. And then third is Judy Dench. Yeah. So Judy Dench plays Lady Catherine de Bourgh. How much screen time would you say Judy Dench has in this movie? Less than she has in Shakespeare in Love. I mean, in Shakespeare in Love, she famously had what, like eight minutes? Yeah. Like she's got less than that. Like exactly. Maybe five minutes of screen time. Correct us if we're wrong. Yeah. She is so arch in this movie. Lady Catherine de Bourgh is an antagonist, but she's not a villain. Right. In this movie, she is a villain. So I want to get to, this is my big criticism of it, which I know to be different than your big criticism. Okay, go so ahead. I'm going to say mine quickly. Yeah, go ahead. This is not Pride and Prejudice. This is a tour of Pride and Prejudice. Right. When you go to a t- like it's like you take a tour to a different country, you go on some kind of group tour or something like that. They're gonna say we're gonna go to Paris and we're gonna take it. We're gonna Eiffel Tower. We're gonna go to the loop. We're gonna do this. You're gonna eat a baguette. You're gonna drink some wine. It's gonna be great. Like I not- just came back from a tour like that. Exactly. Full disclosure. Yeah, you- I work for a company that that produces tours yeah. like that. So I won't you- say the name. You go on these tours. You're not living there. Right. You're not. Ex- you're not. You're maybe not experiencing the place you would if you just lived there for two weeks and just got to hang out. You're get. You're experiencing it in a very different it's way. An overview. Exactly. When you read the book of Pride and Prejudice, you're really fully experiencing it. And when you watch the miniseries based on the way they created it, you're really experiencing it. This movie, they're just saying this happens and this happens and this happens. Remember this thing. This happens. Remember this thing. This happens too. It's the entire thing turned up to eleven. Right. Because they have to just whack through it so fast. Exactly. It is relentless. I mean... Every what, character is turned up to 11. Yeah. And, and what you said... I, I feel like I keep quoting back to you things that you said, but I thought you had a lot of really good observations. I'm very smart. You're, you are very smart. Thank you. Um, what you said was, um, it's really weird that they've crammed so much into this movie and it's still so boring. Yeah. Some words to that effect. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing about movies like this is when you rush through them so fast, you end up not caring about anyone ironically if the movie had been two and a half hours instead of two hours i think it would have been less boring yeah. because you could have learned to care about these people more yeah no i agree i mean just to contrast it with like sense and sensibility mm-hmm. as an adaptation like i feel like that movie is probably two and a half hours long and it doesn't feel like that no it, it doesn't it doesn't feel long like mm-hmm. it feels it feels like the right length and i really appreciate that you didn't compare it to the miniseries we're comparing it to no, another I'm comparing movie it to another another feature film right which goes back to something i was saying before I truly believe this can be done in two, two and a half hours, Mm -hmm. but I don't think this was the script to do it. Yeah. So I might have a few more little things to say, but I want to hear your big criticism of this. Yeah, because all of my individual notes really tie back to this one thing, which is why I said to you, like, I don't have a lot to say about this. I just have one thing to say because everything I have to say has to do with this. Mm -hmm. So Jane Austen was writing about a society where the rules and regulations for behavior were strict. There, you, you could call them strictures, you know? There were ways that you were supposed to behave based on who you were and who your parents were and who your grandparents were and where you lived and what you did. Everyone had a place in society and you absolutely knew your own place and the place of everybody else. And you had to behave in different ways to different people depending on that. And I'm not placing judgment on that for being good or being bad. Like, oh, we could have a whole other conversation yeah, about class systems. Right. And... Like, I don't want to get into a, a discussion no. about the merits or demerits of class. But 
that was the accepted truth at the time. And so I feel like the reason that Jane Austen's work has been so popular and survived up to the present day is that she's able to take this society and use it sort of to her advantage in the way that people interact with each other. Because every sort of real human interaction that people have with each other in her books has this gloss of manners laid on it and the rules and the regulations and the way things are supposed to be. So when those things get violated, it's a really big deal. Um, and the people that violate them, you know something about their character because of what they're doing and who they're doing it to and why they're doing it. Okay. So the plot of Pride and Prejudice is completely dependent on the rules of that society. If the rules of that society don't exist, literally nothing that happens in the book makes any sense. It doesn't make sense that they would behave that way. I will give you a couple of examples. Please give me some specific examples. If it doesn't matter who Elizabeth's parents are, if everybody is just equal, then there is no reason for Darcy to have to have an inner struggle with himself and basically insult her to her face to propose marriage to her. He could just say to her, I love you and I want to marry you. And none of the class issues of his background and her background and her parents and his parents would come into play. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, if it's perfectly fine for men and women to converse with each other before they're married, to be alone together, to run off together, to have sex with each other before, not men and women, but anyone, before marriage, then nothing that happens between Lydia and Wickham would they run off together is shocking. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if... Well, can I bring up a specific example? Yeah, 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 go ahead. So you pointed this out when we were watching it. So there's a scene when we talked about before Jane is sick. I was going to talk about that next. Then please. Yeah. Yes, sorry. So there's a scene very early on. Wait, this was the first moment that I really freaked out. <laughs> there's a scene... Full on freak out. Yeah. You got real mad. <laughs> there's a scene really early... And then something happened immediately after that that was... It was like two things both together. But what's the first one? Um, The first one was that... Oh, it was the pigs in the house. That was what happened next. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll get to it. There was a scene early on that Jane is a guest at Mr. Bingley's house and she is sick in bed. And she is in bed in her nightgown and Elizabeth is there with her. And Bingley comes into the room and has a conversation with her. And in 2017, there is nothing wrong with that. Nothing. In 2005, there's nothing wrong with that. In 1810, for a man to walk into a woman's bedroom, especially when she wasn't dressed and being in bed, like you said the other day, like, or the other day, you said a few minutes ago, like, for Darcy to be dressed the way he was, he might as well have been naked. For a woman to be in her nightgown, even though her nightgown covers literally the exact same parts of her body as her regular clothes and actually more, because it goes all the way up to her neck and all the way down to her wrists, because it's her nightgown and because she's in bed, she might as well be naked. Mm -hmm. She might have well have, as well have been lying there naked and him talking to her. And, every, and it's fine. And it's fine. So if you... They don't... This movie doesn't respect the dictates of the society in which this people these people would have been living and i don't say that just to say like well it's not accurate and therefore it's not good but it's it's because the point of what happens to these characters is that those rules and those dictates get violated sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad but if those rules completely don't exist then it doesn't matter that any of those things happen and it doesn't make sense. Um, you have to do the world building in order to break the rules. You have to know what the rules are. But if the rules are constantly changing and there's no consistency, then there's no reason for us to care about anything that happens because anything might happen and we don't have any understanding of how shocking these things are. And the, the funny thing was that the thing that happens between Wickham and Lydia which is they run off to get married and she's only 16 and it turns out that they're probably not even married and they're just off together probably 
sleeping together. That happens in Jane Austen. They actually made that milder in this movie. Like, it, I forget exactly. No, it wasn't that. You're thinking yeah. about when he... So, basically, what you find out is that Wickham has this past with Darcy. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. It's yeah. it's, it's the situation with, with uh, Darcy's exactly. sister, Georgiana. So, in the book and in the miniseries, Darcy basically found out that Wickham was about to elope with his younger sister. 15-year-old sister. His 15-year-old sister, Georgiana. And he, he, he cut it off right before it happened. In the movie in 2005, he finds out that they... He was at the house visiting and he said he loved her and then they... He said they were going to get married. And then they didn't. And he nipped it in the butt at that point. Yeah. Way less scandalous. Yeah, there was like a full plan for an elopement. Mm -hmm. Like, that's more scandalous. So, like, that didn't make sense to me either. I was like, why would you not go into the actual scandalousness, which is something that's scandalous to us even today, whereas, like... Um, for, here's a really good example. Um, when they go to the ball, um, Mr. Collins says, oh, I know Lady Catherine de Bourgh. She's Mr. Darcy's aunt. So therefore I'm going to go over and introduce myself to Mr. Darcy. And according to the codes of manners, you do not introduce yourself to someone, especially when that person's of higher rank than you. You wait to be introduced by a mutual acquaintance, which is why Mr. at the very beginning, Mr. Bennett has to go over and call on his neighbor, Mr. Bingley, before they can claim an acquaintance with him. So like they wouldn't have been able to dance with him at the ball had Mr. Bingley had had uh, Mr. Bennett not made the acquaintance mm-hmm. of Mr. Bingley. So, that's something that is not something that we understand today to be a problem. You introduce yourself to people all the time. But it's also not a problem in the 2000... They're very, very shocked by well, it in the 2005 uh, movie, mm-hmm. but there's nothing to establish why that would be shocking. And if it's not shocking for a man to walk into a woman's bedroom while she's in bed, why is it shocking for a man to introduce himself to another man? There's yeah. no consistency in the behavior, and therefore none of the events of the plot make sense as to why they're important yeah. and that's that's what really bugged me that they tried to modernize it in this way but they're inconsistent in the way that they're treating the rules of the world that they're trying to establish right so i think the like my biggest problem going along with that is the modernization of it right there are particular reactions that some of the characters have that lizzie has to lady catherine de Burke to judy dench for example she's having them and the reactions she's having are clearly informed by a modern sensibility. Mm-hmm. It's the reaction of the filmmakers saying, oh, this is how you should react to this because it's crazy that yeah, she's saying that these have been weird? super old-fashioned things. You're much more modern than that. But at the time, Lizzie understands how this system works. Right. Or the example that I gave to you was like at the ball where they're dancing and the way that dancing worked at that time was was you weren't with your partner at all times. You were sort of in these formations and crossing and going back and forth and being with other people. And it was like they're trying to talk to each other and have a conversation and like increasingly getting more and more frustrated because every time they try to speak to each other they get separated again by like the motions of the dance Mm -hmm. and that's so modern to think that that would be frustrating but it's also it's it's really funny it's funny it's really funny but the implications of it are really bad for the story as a whole right because you would absolutely have danced that dance a million times before and it wouldn't be surprising and frustrating that you weren't face to face with the person that you were talking to the whole time Mm -hmm. like that's just such a modern sensibility like oh yeah what a weird way to dance with someone to only be with them a quarter of the time and to be with other people the rest of the time Mm -hmm. so so all of my objections to this movie really fall under that umbrella Mm -hmm. so bottom line we didn't like it and also put up your damn hair (sighs) what they their hair was loose and down like 90 percent of the time and it was So frustrating. And she had the most modern bangs I've ever seen. And she wouldn't have, like, modern bangs and, like, a 2005-style messy yoga bun. Right. So... The hair made me really upset. Final thoughts. Um... Pride and Prejudice, the book. Fine classic novel. I am pro. I am... I'm decidedly in the pro column for this book. It's a very good book. Listen to my dramatic reading on LibriVox.org. It's very good. I don't have a plug. So the book's really, really good. As an adaptation, the 1995 one... It is unfair to compare 
other adaptations to this adaptation. Well, and it's unfair to compare, as you say, it is it is kind of unfair to compare a feature length film right. to a six hour miniseries. Right. We have to talk about the film on its own merits, and on its own merits, I believe that it fails. <laughs> It's bad even on its own merits. It's bad on its own merits, even if we don't compare it to the 95. If you'd never seen the 95 version, I feel like the movie would play much better. But when you've seen just how well these moments can play when you don't rush them, the movie just, I I just, I can't get behind it. I can't get behind this movie. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. Like, I really do understand that there are sort of camp, Pride and Prejudice camps. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that 2005 movie is their Pride and Prejudice. Yes. And I don't want to offend any of those people. No. Even if I I, I want everyone to continue to listen. And we're certainly happy to hear from you on Twitter about why you think we're wrong. Um, But I also think, like, we're we're not just... I I hope it, it it has been clear from the particular things that we have talked about that we're not just sort of reacting against it because it's not the 1995 version. Like, there are really things standing on its own that we really both had problems with. Mm -hmm. But I think we can all agree Colin Firth is a little sexy. He's a lot sexy. He's he's, he's quite a bit sexy. How do you feel about Jennifer Ely? I really, really like her. I have a (laughs) proper crush on her. She's very cute. So now it's time for your favorite segment and mine. Yes. So not appearing in this film. Absolutely. I have a candidate uh, for the 2005 version. Do you have a candidate? No, so I second yours. Okay, great. Um, my candidate for Sir not appearing in this film. So we talked about the 1995 version. We really couldn't think of a character that wasn't in it. They're all in it. Yes. Um, but the character that I am going to point out uh, that was missing from the 2005 version is that in the book and the uh, 1995 adaptation, Bingley has two sisters. In the 2005 version, he only has one sister. This is true. And the character that I really miss is not his sister, Mrs. Hurst, but her husband, Mr. Hurst. He's he's a delight. He is drunk and asleep pretty much the entire uh, movie. Um, the other thing that I love about this character is the name of the actor who plays him. Mm-hmm. He is played by the British actor Rupert Van Sittart, uh, also famous for playing the boar in Four Weddings and a Funeral, which we have already talked about, which was also the same year, 1995. Um, so my uh, candidate for Sir Not Appearing in this film is Mr. Hurst, played by Rupert Van Sittart. And there's one other thing I think he was in. Just so everybody knows... He's Yon Royce in Game of Thrones. I've never seen Game of Thrones. Nope. We might talk about it in a future episode. You're going to have to get a a guest co-star. Anyway, so that concludes this episode. Thank you for listening. Do you want to talk about the ways that people can get in touch with us? Uh, So you can get in touch with us in several different ways. If you'd like to go to our website, you can go to adaptorperishcast.com. You can email us at adaptorperishcast at gmail.com. And you can tweet at us at adaptcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any corrections, if you have any things you'd love like for us to talk about. Any suggestions for future episodes? That would be awesome. Absolutely. If you really just want to yell at us about an opinion we've stated on here, we actually want to hear it and we would love to talk about it those in future episodes uh one final thing i do believe that we can commit at this point to doing a follow-up episode at some point in the future because there are a tremendous number of kind of i would call them Uh, how would we define this loose adaptations loose adaptations of pride and prejudice let's give a couple of examples Uh, bridget jones's diary pride and prejudice and zombies bride and prejudice absolutely absolutely there's a number of different ones out there death comes to pemberley oh yeah we want to talk about that we um, have if to you talk have about a that. favorite pride and prejudice adaptation that you want us to read or watch and talk about um please feel free to let us know because we are going to do a follow-up to this episode yeah the only thing we won't do is watch the 2005 version and talk about it again thank you for listening good night